Um, I wanted to introduce you to someone very special before we get started. Oh, here we go. All right. Come on. Come on, Gibbs. Let's do it. Come on. Come on, buddy. Say hi. Oh, look at the face. This here is we go. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> very cute. Does everyone introduce you to their dog? Uh, I do get a lot of dog introductions. It's true. Yes. Yes. I used to do it. I would introduce you to our dog, but she died. So. Oh sorry. no. I'm she sorry. was 14. It happens. It happens. It, was she uh, a golden retriever? She was a, a labradoodle. Labradoodle. Yeah, common. She was very cute, very sweet, and she would do things on the phone on Skype. She would like get up on the desk and. <laughs> And so you have uh, you have a racing background, and is it MX5? Or are you a Mazda guy? Is that your thing? I'm a Mazda guy, but not MX5. As I said, that they tried to use as a jingle or something. Everything I learned about racing, I learned in a Miata. So <laughs> and you would, I, yeah, that, that would be good marketing campaign, right? That's so perfect. Mm -hmm. I yeah, I raced spec Miata back around 2001. I got into it, and so 2007 maybe I raced spec Miata and had a great time doing it, but. You know, I didn't work on my own cars, and I'm not that. I'm not a gearhead like that. Um, and it becomes very difficult to, very expensive. First I was about to say, let's not forget. <laughs> you're forgetting something here, pal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very expensive. But it's also just difficult because you know the, on, especially with those with that um, that series of cars. You know, you, they're you're the front runners are making miniature tune-ups like on you know between sessions and yeah. uh you know just in terms of the setup of the car and all that that, that really do make a difference yeah and so if i wasn't able to do that it was like i was kind of stuck with what i came with and and um so i was i was kind of a mid-pack guy yeah and, uh, but it was fun i had a great time doing it i was gonna say and that's kind of what it's all about right it's it's, it's interesting i was talking to a guy who was like a porsche he was raising porsche at the same time back in those days we used to run um, I guess it was IE we ran uh, as well, a different class as well as the Spec Miata class just to get more track time. But it was like an open class. So it was like ridiculous. Like people hated us. Like the Porsches hated us. We were like, we, we could pass them in any turn. See, you know, anything like the Miatas are flying by the Porsches and then you get out of the turns and they like put their foot down and they go blasting down the straight. And it's like, all right, we'll pass you again the next turn. Yeah. So they, I was talking to one guy, he's like, oh, you're, you're doing that sequence all wrong, man. You just go down the middle of that, you know, and then just put your foot into it. And I'm like, dude, you've never driven a car without horsepower, have you? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it was great when I had that Miata, man, because yeah. I, I would do my own brakes on that thing. And the rotors were like 30 bucks or something. Because Miata, Mazda had such a great support. They have really great support for the club yeah. racers, which is yeah. you get all the stuff real cheap. And so I could do like a $30 brake job on my car. And then I take my wife at the time was driving like an Audi X5, you know, one of these gigantic SUV oh, things. Yeah. It's so heavy and it's got so much horsepower that it just eats through the rotors. And I take it in to get the rotors done. And my guy's like, that's $4,500. I was like, what? <laughs> it's so funny you should say that because I drive an X5M and guess what work I have to have done next week. Those rotors are huge on that car. And so the, the X5M, actually, the rotors are the largest production rotors ever made. That's crazy. It's like a giant platter, man. It's you unbelievable. The, people on that thing. the only thing that's changed is because the Lamborghini came out with the Urus. Now it was usurped by the Urus. So yeah, it. it's just crazy. Yeah. It's so funny. And just like there were just certain things in this book. Like I remember when I was really dialing in, I got out of the car and I said, I just figured out what I'm doing wrong. And the guy goes, tell me. And I said, I'm thinking. I, I do so much better when I'm not thinking. And I know that if I'd read enough like autobiographies of yeah, yeah, yeah. race car drivers, I would have gotten that. But like, that's not how I spend my free time. Yeah. I like books like this. Yeah. And just when you said that, I was like, Oh, this guy, this guy knows what he's talking about. This guy has been in a race car. He's been in a racetrack and he, he people taught him, right? Or, yeah. or that just oh, yeah, yeah. on the no, 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 no. There definitely were influences, but it's it's interesting that the influences 
uh, certainly there were some automotive teachers, you know, that I had coaches, uh, you know, there's always the question of, is Danny based on anyone? And, and he, he sort of is my friend, Kevin York, who does BMW experience coaching. Oh, you're kidding. There you go. Yeah, that's what he does now. And back in the day, he would he was like my first driving coach. And and, you know, obviously you, you talk about that kind of thing, but it, it was a kind of a blend of sort of this, this sort of the, the non racing spiritual world of, you know, it, to the extreme. It's the Eckhart Tolle, you know, the, the right. living in the now, you yeah. know, that sort of a thing. Which is so funny because it's exactly from any sport that you have to that's not right. think about the context of where you are. You just have to execute what you've executed a million times. All right. But to do it without the the noise of the static of the of thinking, right? Right, right. So it really when I when that started coming together, I was like, oh, you know, who better to deliver that message than a dog? Exactly. Right? <laughs> just <laughs> makes sense, right? Because <laughs> if you have a guy doing it, you're like, Oh, it's Star Wars. There's this Yoda dude and he's telling people not to think, but is, you know, put on the helmet with the spizer down Luke and battle the droid, right? That's, That's I mean, right. it's in Star Wars too. Yeah, it's right, right. it is in Star Wars. But it's, it's goofy. It's, when it's in Star Wars, you're like, oh yeah, people don't really do that. Right. But in sports, you really do do that. And yeah. especially racing is one of those sports where the driver, while there's a whole team and while there's voices in the ear, if you have a sound system, you know, if you have a radio system, while there's a pit crew, if you have, you know, You're like, yeah. and there are people helping you, it, the bottom line is it's one person, the driver behind the wheel out there yeah. you know, doing the seeking. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and that's where it has to really uh, come together, I think, mentally for the driver. And what I love about this book is I posted on, I was reading it and I posted on Facebook, like, oh my God, like I got a few chapters in, I was like bawling, you know, I yeah. was there and I posted something on Facebook and all these people commented that, that had read the book and loved it. And most of, the, I would say 99% of them aren't car people. Right, 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 right. This is Which the, was totally the, totally the trick of the book. Intention? Yeah. In earlier drafts of it, you know, before we got to the final, obviously, the um, there was more driving, more racing, more stuff about cars and dynamics and, and that sort of thing in it. Um, I, the trick was finding a balance that would give enough, you know, car candy for the car obsessed <laughs> and, and not so much to turn off the people who aren't car people. That's right. That, that's the concern. That was the balance that I tried to tightrope and you know there are still people who say oh yeah i've skipped over all the stuff for the cars and i'm like seriously because that's like the meat of the book i mean <laughs> that's what it's supposed to be it's supposed to be a deep dive uh it's not a race right. reading interestingly <laughs> enough is not a race uh which is which is kind of cool you know and, and that's why i really love books and i love reading and and you know it takes um it's an interactive sport, even though the writer does it someplace and then it comes out in this little unit and then somebody else interprets it. So there's sort of a disengagement there, but it's also extremely personal connection between the writer and the reader because uh, read, read one person at a time. So yeah. there is that being there. Yeah. You know, I, I did for the book that I wrote after The Art of Racing in the Rain called The Sudden Light. Um, it was about the history of the Northwest timber industry and, and to really understand trees, get this, my my um, sort of method acting system of learning about about writing books is um, I went, I had to climb a bunch of trees, like 150, 200 feet oh. and stuff to, like, to experience that, right? And so I have this like tree climbing guru down in Portland and he calls me, I was like, hey, let's go down to California we're climbing a redwood come on wow. and so it was like super fun but the whole process is he always emphasized to me climbing a tree isn't about getting someplace it's about being someplace and that's what it is with reading a book as well so and you know honestly touring in a car like if you're going for a drive on yeah. a Saturday it's about being in that moment and 
So there's something really spiritually fulfilling about allowing ourselves that time. And especially in this day and age where it's like, there's there, I mean, look, I got like 30 texts since we got on the phone on the Skype here, 30, no less than 30 texts. People asking me who's walking with me down the red carpet, which is kind of cool, but it's insistent and it won't turn off. And we do have to find ways to turn that off and to allow ourselves to have that sort of, self-reflection and it it's difficult because a loaded word but i think it is spiritually helpful to sit down and read a book yeah. or go for a walk without headphones on or go for a drive in your car without the air conditioner but with the windows down right right yeah or not be on the phone i'm not please i know just listen There's to the engine. Nothing more frustrating than <laughs> people with their phone. I'm like, oh, oh that's why you're driving like an idiot. You're on the phone. Talk to me about like, I know I keep going back to this, but so you said your method acting with, you know, you were climbing the trees and I yeah. get your experience in racing, but like, how do you prepare yourself to write like a dog? Like what, <laughs> what happens there? Yeah, that's an interesting question. People always say, did I act like a dog? Did I study dogs? I, I didn't study anything. When I was writing, keep in mind, I wrote two books before The Art of Racing in the Rain. Yeah. And nobody read them. Oh. I mean, nobody cared about me. <laughs> nobody, I could write anything and nobody would even, wouldn't even register on anybody's scale. So when I was writing The Art of Racing in the Rain, I wasn't thinking anybody but the same 1,200 people who read my last book would read it. Right, right. So Enough put, to lose. Yeah, I put stuff in there that, that, kind of was goofy almost. I mean, I used real names. Uh, you know, Don Kitsch is the, the real instructor of performance down at Pacific Raceways. And there's mentions of Ross Bentley, who's a race instructor up here. And so, and I, my nephew, who was seven years old at the time is, uh, you know, I say is one of the great Formula One champions. I mean, I did goofy <laughs> stuff because I didn't think anybody was going to read it. I love it. So that being said, you know, when I was when I was coming up with this character, I never, I never thought of Enzo as a dog. Mm. I mean, I, I knew he was a dog, but I, I thought of him as a nearly human soul trapped in a dog's body, who was this complex character because he was double bound. He, he at once believed he would be reincarnated as a person and he wanted to hurry up and move on to that incarnation. Yeah. But he also loved his family so much he didn't want to leave them. And oh. so he, there was this tension in him and then that created a lot of humor and a lot of kind of fun ways of him to sort of observe the world around him. So it wasn't any, I did not, I did not go to the, you know, Colorado State University and study animal behavior under uh, Temple Grandin or anything like that. You know, I, I didn't do any of that. Which is interesting because I did go after the book to oh, Fort cool. And meet Temple Grandin, who, of course, did all those, you know, yeah, um, I know she is. autism and the animal behavior books and all that kind of stuff. And I talked to her a bunch and, cool. and she came up to me and she's like, she's very funny. She's very kind of uh, quirky and, and, and always thinking of 20 things. And, and so she she came up to me. And she said, I've noticed that uh, teenagers really love your book. I wonder if you can tell me why. And I said, uh, well, geez, I never thought about that, Temple. but." I think it's this teenagers are really identify with Enzo's plight as a dog, you know, because teenagers are really smart. They they're schooled up like way more than, than adults are. Yeah. Their brains have not yet been contaminated by caffeine and alcohol. You know, they're, they're not corrupted yet. Oh. They, if they're younger than 16, they have to, they can't drive themselves around. So they're always asking for permission to do things that they're for fully able to do, but they need their parents and they got, they need the money, they need cash, they need a car, they need transportation. So in a sense, they're just like Enzo, where he can't open the door for himself. Right, right. right? And, and he go only goes outside when he's on a leash. Right. You know, and so there's this, this that thing makes, makes teenagers especially identify with, I believe identify with it. So, it, you know, but I did not study uh, dogness. would go that's part of the reason why I didn't continue with the racing is because no one would you know everybody would go down there with their families and they'd have barbecues and all this and I'd go down there it's just me no one would come with me it's hot and it's sweaty and it's smell you know it's like I said come on guys 
Like my wife came down once and she looked, she's like, I, I can't, this smell is, the smell of burning tires is giving me a headache. She's not wrong. Well, but it's funny that it, it, Enzo says that, right? He's like, uh, he's like everything that made Eve not want to go to the racetrack is what he and Denny loved about the racetrack. The smell of brake pads, the smell of fuel. Oh my God. The smell of like, when you like, when you're walking down the paddock and you're like, oh, you're using uh, rocket fuel, you know, the high octane and stuff, right? From the special right. with diesel, like when I'll smell diesel, I'm like, oh, I love that smell. Like, yeah. I think it is. You either have that in you, or you it either smells great to you. Right. Or it's like cilantro. Either you right. love cilantro. Or you I was just, I was just gonna say, <laughs> just like you know, 14% of the population smells cilantro as soap. All right. Exactly. I, think it's I so feel good. bad for them. <laughs> I know. It's so good. It's so yeah. good. But yeah, when I first started writing the book, she's my first editor. She's she reads everything. She's actually reading my new book now. I'm pressuring her to get it done before we have to go down to L.A. But um, I read, wrote about 40 pages and, and brought it to her and said, this is my launch. What do, what do you think? Should I keep going? Is this is this a, is this going to be a book or not? And she read it and she was like, oh, my God, this is going to this book is going to go around the world, I think. And. She said, but you can't name the you can't name the dog Juan Pablo, because when I originally wrote the book, I named the dog after Juan Pablo Montoya. Right. Yeah. Thinking that's that would not- be hysterical. I said, like, that's that is just an inside joke. That's so funny. Everyone's just going to burst out laughing. But she's not wrong. She's not wrong. <laughs> she's not wrong. But the thing is, we had at that point, we had two boys and we were, we were thinking about having another kid and. There was a lot of debate over what name we would give and this and that. And I just I kept on saying Enzo is the coolest name. Enzo is the coolest name. This kid, we're going to name our kid Enzo. We're going to have a boy. He's going to be Enzo. And she's like, no freaking way. We're naming the kid Enzo Stein. It's just not happening. And then when I showed her the pages and she said uh, that's Juan Pablo is the wrong name. I was like, all right, I kind of knew that. But what do you think a good name would be? And she's like, you know, I think you should use Enzo. And I was like, honey, you know, I'm saving that name for our third boy. And she's like, uh, oh, she, I said, you know, I can't use the name. If we, if I name a character, Enzo, yeah. we can't use that for our kid. Yeah. And she's like, oh, really? I hadn't, I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah. But you really got to go with Enzo. Bullshit. I totally follow up. But she knew exactly what she was doing. She, the whole time. she was like, I'm going to. She totally Enzo. manipulated Right? I'm going to put Enzo in the book and then our kid can be named whatever your kid's name now. That woman's a genius. <laughs> yes. No, she, I really felt kind of, there's sometimes when, when, when guys just should learn to just take it. You've just been, you've been outwitted. Just stop. <laughs> yeah, just, just learn. Yeah. But then yeah you, give, you get rid of your ego. <laughs> You know, it's funny that you would say that because I had this uh, every now and then someone says, you know, sequel, you got to do a sequel. And I'm like, there's no sequel. You know, I very firmly hold yeah, to there is no sequel that's because true. it's like there, there's no sequel to Charlotte's Web. OK, right. just stop. <laughs> Not everything has to have a sequel. I, I, I kind of don't like that. And then yet sometimes I find myself daydreaming and thinking, you know, if Denny did get another dog, <laughs> he would have to name him Dino. He yeah. just would have to. Oh, he'd have to. And he would. Yeah. Well, maybe there is a sequel. <laughs> I can't wait. I mean, I would read the hell out of it, and I think everybody else would. But, yeah, yeah. it's only you know. So did you expect this success? I mean, your wife called it. Were you like, sure, it will, honey, that's very funny? Or were you like, I kind of feel like I got something here, too? No, I, I felt like I got a hold of it. As That's what Stephen King, Stephen King uses that terminology he says uh you know sometimes when he writes a book he feels like he hit a single and sometimes he feels yeah. like he hits a done sometimes he feels like he really got a hold of that one yeah I, I did feel like i really got i really got a hold of it um that being said i mean there's there's a, a vast chasm between a writer getting a hold of a book and it becoming catching on with you know right. the guys right so you know, people say, well, what, what do you do? What do you do to make that happen? And I was like, if anybody could answer that question, every book would be a bestseller, right? Yeah. It's just the way people, uh, we, our world took it, the collective unconscious, like needs some kind of, I believe in this day and age, some kind of trust or belief or hope that there is 
something else. There is a spiritual element to our world. There yeah. is a reckoning. There is king karma. There's you you good people do succeed because they're good, not just you know not because they're devious and mean and you always work in the angles. And I I think people like that in about the book and especially with of course as you know a dog delivering it you know of course. Come yeah, on, dogs are awesome, man. They're like it's all about unconditional love with a dog. Their demands are so small on people. They, you know, it, uh, fresh water, please. Okay, you can do that. Cool. Food. Yeah. Yeah. Tennis ball. Good. We're good. We're totally good. And if all the people around us that we interact with every day, our families, our the, you know, our work peers, and all that, if all they needed was water, food, and a tennis ball. Dude, we'd be rocking our relationship. <laughs> we would. Oprah would be at a job, though. You know, that would be so sad. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. There's, there's that. that. So what about your hopes for this film? Like, I understand you didn't write the screenplay, no. which is kind of sad, but... Um, it's all what, right. What do you... Like, what do you want to... See? Obviously, you've seen it. I'm not going to ask you to yeah. tell me what you think but like what are your hopes for it what are you hoping that it accomplishes well my hope my hope all the time has been that it would um you know be true to the spirit of the book yeah and that's all i can really hope for yeah. and i think it is yeah. um i think people are really going to enjoy it um you know milo is does a fabulous job he's he's just you know that got that even temperedness uh of of a solid race car guy you, you know a, a person, race car, because obviously not, there are men and women in, in racing, but they all have that same drive, that quest for, you know, as close to perfection as possible, understanding that that it's not really reachable, you know, as Juan Manuel Fangio would say, we must we must believe we are the best, but we must we must strive to be the best, but we must never believe that we are. We can't, we can't get complacent, you know, and so there's that that edginess, but there's also a way of not panicking when you're in a situation of panic. Right. And and so there's that element that my, I think Milo does really well with. Um, Amanda Seyfried, I think, is, you know, she's personally, you know, I, I've got a big uh, crush on her in the movie. She's an awesome actress. I think mean, she delivers. I've seen a lot of her movies. I think it's the performance of her lifetime. I must oh, say, but, cool. uh, you know. <laughs> I love, I love her. I think she's great, and I, I kind of have a girl crush on her too. I kind, I get that there is something just so captivating about her. Yeah, yeah that's and, cool. and you know the 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 dog, Parker the dog delivered a tremendous performance. I, I was told Simon Curtis, the director, he said to me, we cut like four or five days off the shooting schedule because Parker always hit his marks. <laughs> And it's, you know, it's great. And so, you know, look, it, it's an, it's, I guess it's an old fashioned movie in the sense that the dog acted without the use of CGI and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, so in that sense, it's kind of fun that, that they could get a performance out of him. And then of course they said, Kevin Costner is going to do the voice. And I was like, wow, that, that's like a different, that just <laughs> stepped us up like a whole. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. I know. It's like it's suddenly somebody gets on your driving team and you're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Juan Manuel Fun. <laughs> uh, oh, Daniel Montoya is going to be my co-driver. I guess our car has a lot more potential than I thought. You know, so it's going to be good. I think people are going to really love it. Hopefully, for me, they they go and read the book because yeah. the book has some more depth to it that you're allowed to indulge in over 360 pages that you can't do in 95 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, it's the ending is. Is brilliant. I think that there's a song that plays at the end, very, very, very end. Simon picked the song to play over as the credits start to roll, and it's 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 genius. It's hmm. genius. Okay. Just, you're laughing and crying and listening to this song, and you just can't help yourself but laugh and cry at the same time. It's brilliant. Yes, Spence is killing. It's not dogs barking out jingle bells. It can't no, be that. No, 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 no. It's even, it's better. It's so <laughs> much better. You're, I can't even, I can't tell you. Okay, because okay. you need to see it. You need to like experience I'll it. I'll see it. I will, and then you'll be like, oh, okay, Garth, I got it. Yeah, <laughs> LA is a funny place. I got, a few years ago, I got a call from um, Ferrari North America guy I knew, a contact I knew there. And, and they're like, uh, 
he mentioned Ferrari a lot in the book. I was like, yeah. And he said, we want to put you in the Ferrari magazine, which is this big, Condé Nast does it. It's this oh, yeah. organic magazine. And uh, I said, uh, well, that's awfully sweet of you, but I don't own a Ferrari. And he's like, oh, don't worry about that. So they flew me down to L.A. And uh, one of the Ferrari dealers arrived at my hotel with a yellow, I think it was a 451. Nice. And, uh, you know, he said, sign this piece of paper. I'm like, what am I signing? He's like, uh, whatever happens to the car is not your responsibility unless you're drunk or doing drugs. And I'm like, no drinking, no drugging. And he's like, <laughs> Oh Here are the God. keys. Go. Cool. And they gave me a photographer from the Czech Republic with one name. And you know it's a good photographer. He's only got one name. Yeah. And we went out and spent the day bombing around L.A. We went up to Mulholland Drive. <laughs> oh, that's it was heaven. Way awesome. And, you know, what I realized is that that car, I mean, I'm like more of a traditional, like I love the, the Dino body. I love the shapeliness of that. I'm not that much into the straight planes yeah yeah it doesn't really do me. you're not a lambo guy that being said it's a beautiful car yeah. and it's a head turner you know even in la we would be at a stoplight and people crossing the street would be looking and like give the thumbs up and that kind of stuff so yeah it, that was one of the perks of, of if you write a book about I was, Ferraris. Just, I was just thinking that i'm so i yeah i'm writing a book of course you know who isn't and uh i'm gonna put as many ferraris in as possible <laughs> Yeah, so, right now. You should put a lot of private jets in too. I'm just saying. <laughs> or like things I like to eat, you know, I'll put like red wine in. You know? yeah. <laughs> oh, but if you write about dogs, there's gonna you're a lot of people are gonna send you dog biscuits. So. Oh, oh, they send you dog I thought they would just send you dog photos. Well, I got tons of photos. Oh my god. So a few years ago, this is years ago now, five years, six years ago. Um, a big manila envelope showed up from my publisher and I just like left it on the, on the mail table and didn't open it for a few days. And my wife came up and she's like, why aren't you opening up that letter? Don't you want to see what's inside? And I'm like, Oh, I don't know. You know, somebody's dog died and they want me to know about it. And she's like, that's really cold. I said, go ahead, open the envelope. So oh, she no. opened the envelope and there's like 10 envelopes inside of it. Each one of them with a three page letter and a picture of a dog that their dog died. <laughs> And I said to my wife, a dog hasn't died in the United States in the last five years without me hearing about it. Trust me. <laughs> so is that, I was just thinking, who's your craziest fan? Can you tell me about your craziest fan or are they so dangerous? Or no, 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 no. I, I have, there's, there's, I don't have too many like psycho fans. I, I have joking stalkers. Okay. Um, there was a, a pediatrician in the Bay Area who used to follow me around and show up at every random reading. I'd be like, what are you doing in San Diego? What are you doing in La Jolla? He's like, oh, I drove down to see you. I was like, that's a long drive, man. I was like, what are you doing in Tucson, Arizona? He's like, I drove over to see you. I'm like, oh, you're starting to creep me out. That's 100% creepy. But the one was really funny. I have a guy and he's, I, we've become friends over the years, but he was just every, in Seattle, he's a Seattle guy. Yeah. He's an engineer. He was an engineer at Boeing. And he came to every every event I did. He was always there, front and center, big old smile, get signing like, 10 books for me to sign for his friends and family every time. He's like the, buying books like crazy, always. And at one point, it was near the holiday season. And at one point, I came home and, and on our doorstep we were two bottles of wine. Nice. Of red and a white, but they were homemade wine. They're, so they're la there were no labels on them, and someone had written on like a, with a silver sharpie what the wine was on it. And then I was like, my, I brought him in, and there was a note from this guy, Chris is his name, and there was this note on it saying, you know, my friend bottles this wine. He has grapes over in Walla Walla, and so you know, ho happy holidays to you and your family. And I brought the bottles, I put them on the table, and my wife's looking at them like crazy. And, and I said, oh, let's, let's give it a try. And so I opened up one. She's like, you're not going to drink that, are you? No, really? <laughs> Some guy left it on our doorstep. You don't even know this guy. And you joke about him being a stalker. And I'm like, you know what? If he wanted to kill me, he would have done it long before now, and he wouldn't use wine. I, don't, I <laughs> totally agree. He had all kinds of other options. How was the wine? It, it was okay, but it was not deadly. But it was just, it was a, sort of this, uh, this is what happens. And I get a little taste of it, you know, with, because I'm a writer and this book has become popular. But if you're, think if you're, think if you're a movie star, 
I mean, everybody thinks that you're writing about them or that you're their best friend or, you know, they're always what. And so I get a little bit of that, but, you know, it's fun. And and, uh, Chris has become a big supporter over the years. And he's a real racing fan. He like has a motor home and he drives to races and like sets up for the weekend. He'll drive, he'll drive from Seattle to Sebring for the race, you know? And, uh, and he gets people's autographs and you know, he has people take pictures with the book. And, and so he's really kind of my, my best champion out there in the, in the automotive world. Yeah. And I think that there, you, you have, it, there is a fine line between the stalkers and the people who become your champions. Right. I mean, that, that's the thing. It's like without evangelists like him, you know, who knows how many balls he started rolling in terms of the popularity of this. Oh Yeah. So, yeah, and, and it's what's great is that he doesn't want anything. You see, right. the problem is the real stalkers want something. Ugh. Can you read my manuscript? Can I, you introduce me to your agent? Can you do this for me? Can you do that for me? And I'm like, no. I, I like the guy who doesn't want anything. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Absolutely. I'll be friends with that guy. Yes, yes. Like, to me, writing this book sounds like so much fun. Mm-hmm. And it just was so much fun. It was heartbreaking to read, but it was also so much fun to read. And I yeah. wonder, was it was it as much fun to write as it seems? Like, was it fun to write, or was it a chore? No, no, it was it was definitely fun. I mean, not everything, not every minute is. Right. There are some chores that one has to do always. Editing is always the difficult part. But there were times when I would like really look forward to going in and get started on this new chapter that I had this idea for, you know, the night before. And there was always something surprising about Enzo. I really vibed with with the character. You know, when I talk about writing and stuff, I, I kind of, I get a little bit spiritual and, and woo-woo about it, I guess, that, that this character came and, and asked me to tell this, this story. And if I had blown it and not done it correctly or whatever, I have no doubt that the dog that became Enzo would have gone and found someone else and said, I got to get a better writer or something. Yeah. We worked well together. I worked well together with Enzo in writing of the book. There are some things in there that I would, we, I would sit down to write and just get totally surprised by something. That's cool. And that, that, that happens when you're writing and that's supposed to happen. It's part of the discovery process. And when I teach writing classes, I say, those are the moments you should be working toward to have like, if you get like 10, 15% of the writing process of a novel is like that, mm-hmm. then you're, that's, that's good. That's, that's right. fine. Right. If you get to 25%, you're kind of, you got a hold of something, right? If, if right. it's at like 80%, which this book was, it's like, forget about it, man. Just like give up your fingers and say, go. And, and that's really what it was like, what it was about writing. Oh, that's so great. Yeah. And you know, Stephen King, it's funny you mentioned Stephen King because I was thinking about his book on writing when you mentioned that you're yeah, right. as your first reader. And he mentioned that in that book, right, about how if you're doing it right at a certain point, you're not writing anymore. It's right. using you to write your book. Right. You're channeling. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Absolutely are. And it's it's a lot of fun to do when that goes when that when you feel it happening. You're like, yeah. And the next day you look at what you wrote and you're like, I don't know who wrote that, but it's pretty good. <laughs> well, you know, I felt that way about Enzo. It was like. I didn't feel like someone made a character. I felt like this dog was talking. Yeah, well, that's what it really would. I mean, he would just come up with stuff. Like I was reading it. They're they're asking me to do a thing for Kindle, where I go through the ebook and then like put little comments in, sort of like a director's commentary on a DVD or something. And so I'm, I'm reading it again, which is odd because I haven't really sat down to read it in ten years. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, I wrote that. That's that's actually a really good turn of phrase. <laughs> I didn't know I could do that. <laughs> Yay, Garth! <laughs> yeah, no, it's really weird, though, because it's almost like it's it's disembodied in a weird way. But there was some stuff that came up that that just was was magical. I, I remember going into work one day and going to, to my writing studio and sitting down and saying, well, you know, before I get started on what I need to do, I'm just going to write or do a writing exercise. I'm going to give myself an assignment. I'm going to, I want to find out what really makes Enzo tick. And how do you do that? Well, you got to put him under pressure and see how he reacts. Okay. So how am I going to do that? I'm going to lock him in the house for three days without food or water. See how he gets out of it. And so I created this scene and a contrivance to make it happen. And I started to write it. And 
what happens? Something gets destroyed and on and on and on. And the next thing I know, I had written this whole chapter that has the zebra in it. Yeah. No, my- it's from the book. And see, it's in the movie, too, which is very cool. Oh, cool. And uh, I got done with it. And I was like, I thought that I, uh, I read it the next day. And I said, oh, this is this is definitely in the book. I mean, not only is it in the book, I didn't plan it. It wasn't in any of my notes. I had no clue. It just came from somewhere I didn't know. And it became, I said, this is the theme of the book. This is the motif that I have to repeat four times. This idea of the demon zebra that is possessing us and making us do things. And and it really was startling to me that that something like that came about so sort of serendipitously. Right. Uh, and that's the magic of of the arts. Yeah. And and when I say the arts, I use a very loose uh, definition of that. I mean, if you think about a race car, there are moments where I believe uh, at speed, a race car driver doesn't even know what he or she did. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. But it was pivotal and the, it was essential. And if it hadn't happened, the whole thing was over. Yeah. yeah. And Ayrton Senna writes about that, you know, in his, he wrote a couple of little books. He, he talks about, you know, feeling the, it, he was the great qualifier. Right. You know, he was, you, you couldn't pass him. If he was on pole, you know, in Formula One, it's hard to pass anyway, right? You know, right. it's only gotten worse since right. his era. Yeah, 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 yeah. Especially these but, guys. You know, you don't want, you don't want Lewis Hamilton on pole and you don't want Eric <laughs> on pole, not. you know? We, 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 so we, we try and use our, like, labels, use arts and that kind of stuff to such a degree. I mean, honestly, it's, it's, there's the... For anything, any skill, there's an I believe there's an art and there's a craft element of it. And the craft is the stuff that we can teach. And so with the sports and arts really do come together on this level. Yeah. There's the craft of downhill ski racing. And you learn the craft and you learn where your knees are supposed to be. And you learn where your edges are supposed to be. And you learn how to tuck. And you, you, you can practice that stuff and you, you get really good at it. And yet it's the sublime stuff that happens in the course of doing it that creates the champion, not the skills have to be there in order to release the conscious mind of its responsibilities and allow it to become subconscious or, or super conscious. Right. Or or in, 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 um, inspirational. Yeah. And that inspiration with musicians, with writers, with painters, with in the arts, it's easy to see because you're like you can look at it. People don't tend to think of that with um, with athletes, but it, it, it I believe it's there as well. You know, Michael Jordan, you know, from my era, uh, mm-hmm. and I was a New York Knicks fan because I was living in New York at the time. So yeah. I hate Michael Jordan pretty much more than anybody in the world <laughs> except Bill Lambeer. Uh, he's he was really lucky. He was super lucky, mm-hmm. but you know why he was so lucky? Because he was really good and he practiced really hard. That's it. So I think it's the same thing with the disciplines of writing and of the arts and of the sports. And you know, the, the ones who practice the most tend to get lucky. That's the thing. Well, the harder I work, the lucky I get or whatever that expression yeah. is, right? And so do you do any um, talks or podcasts or anything about the creative process? Like, forgive me for not knowing, but like. No, do you- I don't do a podcast or anything. Yeah. I never have. I mean, I I just never turned in that direction. I do talk. I do do a lot of talks, and um, I do community reads for around this book has got such life. I go to a city, and I'll do. I'm going to Fargo, North Dakota, in, in the fall to do community reads. Cool. I picked it. I said yes specifically because that's my fiftieth state. Ah, well then after, you had to do it. After North Dakota, I'm done. Okay. Um, but all, what I always try and do is, uh, if I'm going to do a community read program, I'll, I'll do some outreach and try and go to a high school, for instance. I think high schools are really important to talk to kids about this sort of stuff because they're so overloaded with, with people telling them what to do. You know, they, they need to start to under, listen to their own intuition yeah. and, and not be a passenger in you know the decisions they're they're going to be making, which are going to be pretty significant pretty quickly, as you know with yes. your your daughter, right? You know, you, at some point, you, if it doesn't resonate with you, 
and you're just doing it to please Uncle Bob, you're doing it for the wrong reason. So yeah. don't do it. Just spare us all the angst and the time. Just yeah. don't do it. Well, I just find it very interesting listening to you talk about the creative process and about, you know, you, you clearly have a metaphysical interest. And it's mm -hmm. it's interesting hearing a guy like you talk about it because it's not like listening to Eckhart Tolle and it's not like listening to Oprah. And I do think that we are living, you know, no pressure, Garth, but we're living in a time <laughs> where like straight white guys could really listen, to, could use that. Oh, all right, all right. I can. I'm just saying. I'm just. No, no, no. no. I, I, trust me, man. I, I know. It's like I. It's the. It's the. It, I was on a panel at a writers conference last month, and and in fact, with uh, three women, two of them being of color, were my my. And they're like talking about this, 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 this. And the moderator turns to me and he's like, "Garth, you have anything to add?" And I'm like, "I'm the white guy." Um, they said it perfectly. I agree with everything they said. <laughs> you don't need me to white man speak this. They did. So it, I am. That's what that's what the 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 world is, and I and I'm I'm happy for it. I think it's great. Um, you know, if if I, it's a it's a dangerous line doing podcasts and all that kind of stuff. Who knows? Maybe maybe one day. I like being guests. I'll I'll be a guest on yeah yeah or a book or or just even through. Through what you did in that book, that's powerful enough. Do you know what I mean? There, there's something to be said for that. Like you gave a spiritual message to people who weren't approaching that book to get one. Well, it, it's interesting. And I, and I do res respect it. I do understand that it's a thing. I, I get what's going on. And so my new book that I'm working on is called A Couple of Old Birds. Okay. And it was kind of inspired by my mother, who's 89 years old. But it was about like it's about a, the main character is 87, and and her her husband has passed away, and she's trying to figure out what 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 do you do now? What do you do next? And and is it is it it? Is it over? I mean, is there done or is there another chapter? Yeah. And then she meets her, her next door neighbor when she moves into a condominium and, and she's 84 and they become best friends and they start to kind of solve each other's problems. And, and I'm like, OK, that's that's a book about that that experience. But how does it become more re relevant in today's world? And so having grown up in Seattle for the most part with uh, my father was a Jewish guy, a kid from Brooklyn and my mother Irish and Clinton Indian from Alaska, two very far apart, yeah. and they came together. I remember when they bought our house in 1972, and in that time they had to sign neighborhood covenants, which said no black people or Jews are allowed to buy a house in this neighborhood. And that's how Seattle's sort of, they call it redlining, and, and so Seattle has this kind of base of racism. So I said, you know, I want to address that. It was uncomfortable for my father to sign a piece of paper, even though it was invalidated by the Supreme Court. He still had to sign it because that was, oh, how was awful. weird, right? And so uh, saying that he wasn't allowed to own a house where he was buying a house. And so rather than have him be Jewish, though, I have my main character, who's white woman, but she is from a mixed race marriage. So her husband was black. And so there, I have a whole element of this that I, I, I like to talk about. And people have cautioned me. They said, you're going to be accused of cultural appropriation and this and that. And I said... Well, first of all, my main character is white. So second, and I did go through this, my father who was Jewish had to, you know, had to do this. So I, I have a, some sense of what was going on here. But honestly, you want me talking about this. I'm the guy you want talking about this. Exactly. Because I'm the white guy. It, they'll listen to you. Right. And I'm going out there to the other white guys and saying, don't be a white guy. That's exactly my point. Exactly. And I think you're absolutely right. Um, have you read the book, A Man Called Ova? Yeah, 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 for sure. Right. And I love that book and I love that character and I love the whole sob Audi thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Of course. Yeah. Thing. That was fucking brilliant. That was, was great. And then he went and bought a BMW. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I can't be your friend anymore. You bought a BMW. <laughs> yeah, but when you said, but it's funny because I didn't know you were going to go down the race path, but when you said like, when your partner dies, then what do you do? I thought of a man called Ova, right? Because he was just so lost um, yeah. when yeah. his wife died. But it is, it is, and for women, it is exceptionally complex because you've been a caretaker. And like, what do you do when there's no one left to take care of? Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. what happens? Yeah. 
it's an interesting, and especially people are so healthy these days. You know, my mother, you know, 89 drives around. She's, yeah. I mean, she's perfectly functional. She goes to tap, tap, tap dancing once a week, <laughs> the whole thing. So, you know, there, you don't have to, it, it, it's, I, I think it's going to be good. I, I really hope that, that people, you know, take it with the right sort of uh, spirit that I, that I intended for it, which is to have this discussion about aging and about, uh, intimacy and about families and about race, you know? Yeah. And when, by the way, the scene where old white grandma goes in to get her, you know, black grandson out of trouble for, at their shopping mall. Right. I mean, she blows up that place. Like, <laughs> like nobody's business. Is it? I think it's going to be, uh, it may not be revelatory in terms of, you know, some of the, discussion that's going on on a very deep level, which is all really good stuff. But I think that you want this discussion to happen, you yeah. know, in the shopping malls in Kansas City, as well as in the intellectual hubs of New York and Chicago and L.A. and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Not that Kansas City is not an intellectual hub. I didn't mean to imply that, <laughs> except that there's a different culture you know, Absolutely. and so forth. Absolutely. Um, so it's called Two Birds. What's it called? It's called, well, right now the title is A Couple of Old Birds. A couple, I love that. A couple of and, birds. And the question is whether they'll let me, how much pushback they're going to give. Because I can tell right away they're going to be like, uh, no. And then I'm going to say, yeah. And they'll say, oh, it's great. So we'll it's, see how, we'll see who wins. I know who's going to win. <laughs> we My might. Gonna win. I know that. <laughs> and so... Just for people who want more of Garth, um, more, you know, want to read more from you, should they should they read the books that you wrote before? The article? Oh, yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, no, Raven Stole the Moon was my first. Uh, yeah. It takes place in Alaska and deals with my mother's background, Clinkin Indian background. Oh, cool. I am, a, I am, oddly enough, a card-carrying Clinkin Indian, and so I... I'm a member of the tribe and I get my my biannual checks from the government because they took my people's land. Oh, yeah. Still, we still get uh, compensation for that. Um, uh, and then my second book was uh, How Evan Broke His Head and Other Secrets. Yeah. About a rock musician who has epilepsy. Um, and then right, First Year of Racing in the Rain. And then A Sudden Light was my latest one, which is... Uh, which is very kind of a ghost story, but it's a very spiritual ghost story, and it's about family issues and all that. And then my new one, of course. And then I'm doing this. Uh, oh my gosh, the my 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 uh, graphic novel will be out next year. Oh. What's that about? Uh, you can't say. Do mutant goat people living underneath the freeway in Seattle, hiding no. in plain sight? Yeah, so I was gonna guess that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's about misinformation and disinformation and and that stuff as well and the illuminati sneaks in there at some point and right. uh you know don't believe everything you you see on television you know that kind of thing so. and what about this play brother jones yeah the play brother jones was was put up once down in la in 2005 it became a sudden light it became my novel a sudden light oh, okay okay great so right. that was sort of the the origins of it were as this play and then i wanted to expand on it some more so i don't think it's ever it was good it's a good play but it's it had some flaws in it that would need to be addressed before anything happened with it um and i don't have the it's not on my radar to kind of work with that oh i'd like to write another play because i love theater yeah plays are great but um it served its purpose which was to inform a sudden light Cool. And what about social media? People want to follow you. Yeah, I do the whole Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. I'm pretty, pretty easy to find. I just don't get the whole social media. I don't really get it at all. I, I, I think people either get it or they don't. I mean, Twitter's pretty great for automotive. Yeah. Like car guys. I've made some of my best car guy friends. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, Twitter's good. I like Twitter. I like Twitter. I tried doing the Instagram thing, and I think I do it all wrong. And then, so then my publicist is like, we're taking that away from you, and we're giving it to a special. I'm like, what does that mean? Then it just becomes a billboard for me, you know? That's it's like, right. And then my 12-year-old starts mocking me because I don't have as many followers as, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, believe me. Welcome to my world. And, I, yeah, I, I get it. And the problem with... 
if you're a writer, what's hard about Instagram is that it's visual, right? So it's like, yeah. you have to, and it's all about you taking pictures of you being you, and you don't seem like that kind of guy. It's like, that's hard. Yeah, no, I get so frustrated with this. Not everything. You don't have to take a picture of everything, man. Sometimes you should just experience the thing, man. Right. It, it, we went in a few years ago. I took, we went to Europe for a little holiday there. And, and my, my boys, my older boys, I guess, were like 15 and 13 at the time. And um, we were in Paris and they're like, it was just me. I just had them. My wife had my younger guy somewhere else. So it was just the three. It was like a dad tour. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. It was fun because we did like backpack, you know, we did, took trains and, you know, you're rail and we did backpacks. Yeah. It was like, but with my kids and the, on a dad tour of Paris, you know, we had like the, the speed pass to go to the Musée d'Orsay and it's still an hour and a half wait. It's like, no, we're not doing that. Yeah. The sewer museum is way cooler. <laughs> if you haven't been there, you got to go to okay. the sewer museum. That sounds fantastic. Sounds like just up my alley. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's so, no, cause that was like the first like urban it's so cool the way they, it's a beautiful down there. And it's, it actually is a working sewer. It's disgusting, but it's beautiful with these arches. And anyway, okay. the, the, my boy said, we, we got it. We're here in Paris. We've got to go see the Mona Lisa. And I'm like, really? It's anticlimactic. Yeah. I've seen it. And they're like, we're, we're in Paris. I was like, all right, we're going. Make a beeline. And the Louvre is just packed with people. And you get to Salle five or whatever the, the room is. And, gigantic room filled with hundreds of people little teeny way on the other side you can see the little teeny mona lisa behind 10 layers of glass glass and everybody like the photos that my kids took of this was hysterical because everybody's got their phone up and they're taking a picture of the mona lisa so all you can see of the mona lisa is looking through other people's phones at the mona yeah yeah i'm like that's not there's so much art out there that is not as, and so we had this huge long discussion about what makes art famous and why everyone needs to see that piece when there's like brilliant art that no one's looking at right around the corner. So it was kind of fun to have that conversation, but it is this obsession that people have with recording and videotaping and you go to a concert so you can videotape yourself at the concert and you're not even listening to the music. Why experience the music, man? Or the poor people who, you know, the National Park System just came out with the how to not die while you're taking a selfie, guys. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> like, literally, we just people, because I was at, I was at like a press junket at the Grand Canyon. And they were like, will you distribute this to your followers? And I was like, sure. And it literally was like, how to, t how to safely take a selfie. Like, when you're walking backwards, turn around and be sure that the Grand Canyon is not behind you because so many people are dying. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's just not right. It's not. Anyway, so yeah, live in the live in the moment. Experience the Grand Canyon without a camera. It's, yeah. it's awesome. That's you can true. always get a picture of it. And by the way, there's some great photographers out there who photograph the Grand Canyon way better than you can with that's your phone. Right. Don't bother. Don't bother. <laughs> when your iPhone should just stay home. Right. Anyway, that's kind of cynical, I guess. No, no, it's all good. It's all good. But I thank you so much for your time. I'm seeing the movie on Monday on the cool. lot, like one of those screenings. So I'm super oh, cool. excited. I'm taking um, my 12-year-old with me. She's excited. Oh, great. Yeah. She, great. She's excited. You might want to bring a little bit of Kleenex, I'm just saying. Maybe. Dude, I know. I've already warned her. She goes, wait, Mom, is that the book where you started crying three pages in? <laughs> Well, Freya, I mean, you know, the, the dog, and she goes, is the dog going to die? And I said, no, but you know in the beginning that the dog's going to yeah, die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a no big deal. It's a, it's a life-affirming story, but there, you have to go through peaks and valleys in order to get there. That's all. I figure. I figure. So I warned her, so, but she said she's still in, so we'll see. We'll see if she does. Right. <laughs> anyway, I'm so grateful for your time. Yeah, yeah. I just got, it was great uh, meeting you and talking to you and I got such great information. So I thank you so much and, great. um, and good luck with everything. And yeah, I thanks. Be, I'll buy all the books. I'm a big fan. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And it's been a pleasure being on your, your show and I'll, I'll be sure to get it out to my you know, 332 followers and all that. <laughs> right on. Why? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, take okay, care. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye -bye.